Isn't that the kind of stories that most warm our hearts and gives us hope in humanity? In his 2021 book, Saving My Enemy, the author Bob Welsh tells of an unlikely friendship between two former enemies. On one side, we have Don Malaki. Malak, part of Easy Company, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division. He was made famous by the 2001 HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. How many of you here have watched that series? Uh, a few of you, yeah. So, yeah, it's probably not recommended for, for children, right? It's quite violent. But if you watched it, and I have, uh, then you know the story of Malak. Though he survived the war himself without any serious injury, Malaki struggled with the deaths of his comrades. And this includes his best friend, Warren Mark, who died in the infamous Battle of the Bouch, which took place in the Aden Forest around Christmas of 1944, the year before the war ended. But serving on the German side in this same confrontation was this man called Fritz Engelbert, and Fritz served in the tank division, the Panzerler division. And he was the only survivor in his unit. For many years afterward, Engelbert was stricken with guilt, not just for being the only person who survived in his unit, but also for his role in the Nazi war efforts. Finally, 60 years later, through his son Matthias, Engelbert was finally able to meet Malaki at an annual gathering of Easy Company. And the two of them shared war stories. And the most amazing thing that happened at that gathering was how Malaki extended acceptance of Engelbert, even going so far as to welcome him with a toast into their band of brothers. For years afterwards, they kept in touch with each other and helped each other in their healing process. And that's why the title of this book is Saving My Enemy. Well, God's unlikely grace to, God's, to, to unlikely people is our subject for today. And like the title of Welsh book, it is about how God saves his enemies. It's the story of how you and I, wretched sinners, are turned by God from his enemies into his friends. But our story, our own story, must begin with another story of God's unlikely grace, which we have just read from Luke chapter 1. And the author of this gospel, his name is Luke, he set out to write an orderly account of what the eyewitnesses had passed on, the tradition about the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke is also the only one among the four gospel writers who goes slightly further back in time to recount the conception and birth of John the Baptist, which took place about five to six months before Christ himself. In Luke chapter 1, we shall see how God's grace is announced to Zechariah, and then it was anticipated by the parents before it was actualized. And then we shall end by reflecting on God's unlikely grace to us in Christ. So let's take a look first at God's grace announced from verses 5 to 17. And we read this from verse 5. Can you please read this together with me? In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So from the start, we are introduced here to a most deserving and yet most unlikely couple to receive God's grace of a child. Zechariah the priest, Elizabeth his wife. They were both descended from the tribe of Levi and the priestly line of Aaron. And they are both called righteous before God in regard to their keeping of the law. Later, in verse 13, the angel would tell Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. And this tells us that this couple has been praying and asking God for a child. 
And surely you will expect God to hear their prayer and grant them and bless them with a child, right? But verse 7 tells us that this was not to be. It says they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. See, for this couple, their years of piety has gone unrewarded. Barrenness, which was then seen as a sign of God's displeasure, had fallen upon them. And so later, Elizabeth would thank God for removing her reproach among people when she finally conceived. Now, this story should remind us of another couple earlier in the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah. They too are described as obeying God's voice and keeping his commands and statutes. God also promised them a son in their old age. Therefore, we can tell that this conception of John is but another story, another reminder that God is keeping his promise to Israel. Over the past two months, if you've been with us, we've been reading through the Lament Psalms in book three of the Psalms, right? And so Zechariah and Elizabeth, as faithful Jews, they may well have prayed some of these Psalms. For example, Psalm 73, verse 1. They may have said, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, as for us, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. Or perhaps Psalm 80, verse 6. You make us an object of contention for our neighbours, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts, let your face shine, that we may be saved. Indeed, many of the other biblical laments in the Psalms as well, they may have well prayed those. And you and I may well have prayed something like this too. Well, how do we know that God does listen to us and that God will heed our pleas? Let us see from verse 8. Now, while he, Zechariah, was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lots to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Now, this hour of the incense, we are not told, we are not sure whether it was the morning or the evening hour of incense. There were two in the day. And at this hour, a priest who was on duty would be tasked with the honour of burning incense, which comprises gum, resin, onica, uh, galbanum, frankincense, and salt on this altar. And this is a privilege because each priest may only do so once in his lifetime and is chosen by lot to do this. So the 24 priestly divisions of Israel, they are rostered to be on duty one week at a time, which works out to roughly twice a year. Zechariah was from the division of Abijah, the, the eighth of 24 divisions. He so happens to be on duty that day. He was chosen by lot for this task. Of course, Luke doesn't want us to think that it is by chance. Not, it's not a coincidence. Rather, it is through God's providential leading and in God's sovereign will that Zechariah was there to meet this angel. How about you? Do you believe that you are here today by chance? That everyone else is away on holiday but you are stuck here and so you have no choice? Is it by chance that you have been born into a believing family to faithful parents who have passed on the gospel to you? Or that you met a friend who invited you to church years ago or even today? Or that your unbelieving parents, like mine, sent you to a mission school where you got to hear and believe the gospel? Is it really all by chance and just so happens? Or have we been chosen by lot in God's providence and according to His will? Let's take some time to ponder about this, this Christmas. Later, the angel would give his name as Gabriel, which means God's mighty one. This Gabriel will be the same angel who will announce Christ's conception to Mary from verse 26. Verse 26. 
But lest you are now looking forward to meet a chubby, adorable angel like Gabriel, do note how the sight of God's mighty one actually caused Zechariah to be troubled and gripped by fear. So in verse 13, Gabriel had to assure him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. See, the angel is telling Zechariah here that this son to be born to him and Elizabeth will be no ordinary child. His parents will have joy, naturally, because their prayer is answered. But many others will also rejoice on account of him. Why so? Well, typically, the birth of a child is celebrated by whom? By the parents and their immediate family and perhaps some close friends, right? Surely you wouldn't expect a whole nation to declare a public holiday and rejoice unless this child so happens to be a royal heir like Prince George, who is now second in, in line to the British throne, or perhaps like the recent hype over the public appearances of North Korea leader Kim Jong-un's 10-year-old daughter, Kim joo Ai, because the world is now wondering, might this second child of his become his successor? Well, John is no royal heir. He's no future king, but his name will give us the clue to his significance. His Hebrew name, Jochanan, means God is gracious. To Abraham, God had said in Genesis 17 verse 19, Sarah, your, son, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Here the angel told Zechariah, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now if you compare the two uh, the two pronouncements, you realize that they are almost word for word, except for the replacement of the names. And so this leads the commentator James Edwards to suggest that the name John signifies that the childlessness and insufficiency of the aged couple have been relieved, not by their own piety or merit, but by divine grace. So you see, John is God's grace to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Indeed, Zechariah's own name, which means remembered by God, also hints that God is going to keep this covenant with Israel. But the joy and gladness that this gift of grace brings to Zechariah, to Elizabeth, and to many others go beyond the mere birth of a child. It is really the, birth, the joy that is brought on by the coming age of the Messiah, which John shall be announcing. Now, while John may not be a royal heir, he is the one who announces the coming of God's heir, God's firstborn son. And John's birth will signal the dawn of God's grace upon his people through his own son. So that is the truest meaning of the name John. God is gracious. In verse 15, Gabriel will command Zechariah not to let John fill himself with wine or spirits as he grows up, as instead he shall be filled with God's Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, from the womb. We shall see this very soon, later, when John leapt in his mother's womb, when he was in the presence of the Lord Jesus, who was in his mother's womb. And the effect of John's ministry will be such, it will be restorative. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just. So you can describe it as a turning ministry. It's just turning, turning. Whereby the hearts of fathers will turn in compassion to their disobedient children and the minds of the unruly will turn to the wisdom of the righteous. In short, many hearts will be turned back to God through John's ministry. He's the one who will go before God in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare a people for the Lord. The angel Gabriel here is really quoting the prophet Malachi, to whom God has said in Malachi 4 verses 5 to 6, let's read this together. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And also chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. See, the prophet Malachi here was speaking of the prophet Elijah preparing the way for the Lord, that is Yahweh, as his messenger. But here, according to Luke, John is the end-time Elijah, and he will prepare the way for the Lord, that is Jesus. And this will happen very soon in Luke 3, as Jesus begins his earthly ministry. God's grace has been announced in the birth of John and through his name, John. But this grace has to be anticipated a little while more, as we shall see in verses 18 to 25. In verse 18, shall we read this together? And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Such good news, right? What are some news that you've heard that sound too good to be true? The National Crime Prevention Council uh, ran this recent scam awareness commercial on TV recently. So those of you who still watch local TV, you may have seen it, right? How many of you watch local TV? Just do a survey. Not many, right? But if you, if you happen to catch it, you will remember this. In this commercial, a man loses all his savings to this job scam. This scam offers him a fantastic $400 a day. And he thought, oh, this is 10 times my, my current pay. But he ends up in tears. And so the tagline is this. If that new job is too good to be true, it might be a scam. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? That's the old saying. And Zechariah must have thought this, rightly so, because he says, I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. So this must be a scam. Well, not in this case, because of who the promise maker is. Who is the promise maker? It's not the angel Gabriel, but rather the one whom Gabriel serves. He says, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. God is no scammer. As a sign to Zechariah that this is not a scam, but also as a rebuke to him, Zechariah will be struck silent and unable to speak until God's promise is fulfilled. Later in verse 62, we will find the neighbors and relatives having to make signs to Zechariah in order to ask his decision for the name for John. And this may well imply that Zechariah was not just struck mute, but also deaf. That is to say, he became silent. He couldn't hear anything, and he was unable to speak. Verse 21, The people at the temple were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, that means that one week was up, he went back to his home. See, here there must be a necessary time of waiting and anticipation before this vision is fulfilled. But all this time, over these nine months, Zechariah couldn't declare the good news. He couldn't share this joy with anyone except perhaps his wife. In verse 40, 24, After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done to me, for me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my reproach among people. Why does Elizabeth have to hide herself for, for these five months? I suggest to you, perhaps after hearing or knowing about her own pregnancy, Elizabeth now felt the social humiliation from her barrenness 
even more acutely. And so she was hiding herself for five months until her pregnancy can become apparent to everyone. Then she can finally come forth, hit hell high, no longer ashamed to be barren. Her words here echo those of Rachel in Genesis 30. Rachel's barren womb was also opened by God, and as she bore Joseph, she also proclaimed, God has taken away my reproach. Let me ask you, how often do you and I pray to God for good things, whether it's good results or a promotion at work or a life partner or even a child like Zechariah and Elizabeth? And then having received it from God, we then go and make it all about ourselves. I'm sure you and I are painfully familiar with this. We're aware, right? This is our tendency. We like to think that having done all this, in the end, it is our merits, our hard work, our wealth that has earned us that reward. But Elizabeth was not like that. Her words, while waiting in seclusion, placed the emphasis solely on what the Lord has done for her, what, how the Lord has looked upon her, and how the Lord has taken away her reproach. She doesn't forget the giver for her gifts. She's not distracted by God's blessing of the child, but she remains focused on God, the blesser. She acknowledges this baby to be God's grace to her, not because of what she has done or not done, but because of God's own kindness to her. She and Zechariah anticipates this child, this arrival of God's grace, simply by faith. Finally, in verses 57 to 66, we shall see God's grace actualized. But in between, just to bridge the gap, uh, Luke will record for us the second angelic appearance. This time, Gabriel appears to Mary and informs Mary of her conception of God's own son, Jesus. Mary would then visit Elizabeth, who was by then six months pregnant. Elizabeth declares Mary and her baby blessed as John leapt for joy in her womb. And then in verse 56, we learn that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months until the ninth month when Elizabeth was due to give birth to John. And then we read this together from verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth, just join me, to give birth. And she bore a son. And her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. And they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after their, his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. Finally, the long-awaited baby is born. And we read how immediately he brought much joy to many of Elizabeth's neighbours and relatives, as the angel had said in verse 14. They rejoiced with Elizabeth at God's mercy to her, for giving her a child in her old age. <clears throat> and then later, they came together again once more on the eighth day for the child's circumcision. But this is also when this group of neighbours and relatives start to become capable Right, they, they started to become meddlers or busybodies. Seeing that Zechariah couldn't, still, couldn't speak yet to give a name to this child, they started to propose names for his son. Perhaps in their mind, they thought that it's not natural. A child should have a name <coughs> at birth rather than eight days later at the circumcision. And so they decided to imitate the Greek culture among them at that time. They decided to, they started calling the child Zechariah, son of Zechariah. Right? This is something like Zechariah Jr. today. How many juniors do you know? So here are some famous people named after their fathers. From the left, Robert Downey Jr., right, who's been immortalized uh, today as Iron Man. We also have in the center, civil rights leader, the late Martin Luther King Jr. And the latter even has a son named Martin Luther King III. So it's a, it's a trend today, right, in the West especially, to name a son after the father. And it seems like the people at that time were adopting the Greek culture as well to call Zechariah son of Zechariah. 
Although Zechariah couldn't speak at this moment to protest, he couldn't make known his will, it seems like he has somehow before this, either by signing or by writing, given the name John to Elizabeth. And so Elizabeth gives the name John in verse 60. But there are protests by the neighbours and relatives, and they say, none of your relatives is caught by this name. Now, it wasn't unusual for a mother to name her own child. There are lots of biblical examples of this. However, it seems that at that time, it was against the societal norms not to name a child after a relative, whether the father or the grandfather. But what is clear here is that these friends and relatives, they pose a threat to Zechariah and Elizabeth. What threat is that? Whether they will obey God now that their prayer for a child has been answered by God. Now that God's grace, John, has been actualized and now is resting in their arms, will they now obey the angel's command and God's will for them? Or will they instead cave in to pressure from their relatives and friends? As we read, thankfully, they remained faithful and obedient to God. In verse 62, And they, their relatives and neighbours, made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbours. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. With this final confirmation from Zechariah, the relatives and friends finally gave up. They are fully convinced that this child will be called John. And from this point, Zechariah's mouth is finally opened to bless God for what he has done. And their emotions, this, this crowd's emotion, turned from amazement at first to fear as they talked about these happenings through all the hill country of Judea. So basically, they spoke about it so much that others also started to hear and to ponder on the significance of this boy, John. See, God's grace that has been announced and anticipated is finally actualized in the birth of John. And on this baby, the Lord's hand will remain. But that was not the end of the story because John's ministry from birth to death is ultimately not to point people to himself, but rather to God's unlikely grace in Christ. And this grace is what Zechariah prophesied about from verse 67 onwards. And he was so excited, he actually prophesied in one long sentence. <clears throat> okay, so please join me to read this. Uh, there are two slides. Please join me to read uh, what Zechariah prayed together from verse 68. And before that, you need to take a deep breath. Okay, let's say, it's verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace." <clears throat> catch your breath. I also need to catch my breath. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Joe. Now, do you see how Zechariah was so filled with joy that he couldn't help himself? He just rattled on and praised God. But what was he really saying here? Do you remember the cry of the psalmist Ethan in Psalm 86 last week, where the psalmist asked God, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which 
by your faithfulness you swore to David. Right? So he questions God, have you forgotten to be steadfast in your love and faithful? Well, to Zechariah, God's steadfast love and faithfulness are clearly seen in the birth of his son, John. For John shall become the prophet of the Most High. He will prepare the way for the Lord, who is Jesus Christ, the offspring of David, to whom God promised an everlasting kingdom. Zechariah even goes further back in time to God's covenants to, to Abraham in Genesis 12, and he sees in Christ the ultimate and fullest fulfillment of all of God's promises. See, Zechariah is clear. Jesus Christ is God's unlikely grace to us. And God's grace is unlikely not because God himself is unable or unwilling, but it's because of how undeserving we are to receive his grace. But that is precisely why it's called grace. Our personal unworthiness does not cancel out, does not stop God's grace. God cannot be stopped from keeping his covenant promises because of his unchanging character, because of his steadfast love and faithfulness. And that is why Paul will later say in Romans 5 verse 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. God's gift is for the unworthy. He goes on to say this, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. See, God's grace to us is unstoppable. And that is why you and I can hold fast to God's promised grace to us in Christ against all our personal doubts and all societal pressures. First, our personal doubts. It is natural for us to question and even doubt some of God's promises sometimes, right? Well, we see here that Zechariah himself didn't believe the angel's words. He said, how shall I know this? How shall I experience this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Later in Luke chapter 7, John the Baptist himself will doubt. He will ask Jesus this, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? The psalmist have also shared his doubts with us, and we've already heard them. They question God's goodness to them as well. You and I may have similar doubts like this because of some severe trials that we are going through. And in spite of months and years of prayer and seeking God, we have not seen an end to this, and we do not yet see any end in sight. But since now we know what God has already done for us in Christ, even though all this sounds too good to be true, we can be certain that it is not a scam. Because God is not a scammer. And so our faithful response to the Lord can be this, can be to pray along the psalmist, How long, O Lord? Because we can trust his steadfast love, that it is not whether he will or not, but it's a matter of time before he acts for us. The second threat comes from when others pose a, a, a threat to us, trusting God and following him when they tempt us to follow societal norms instead, will we press on in obedience to God's revelation and will? Now, Satan may accuse us of sins and cause us to doubt whether we are worthy of God's grace. Neighbours and relatives may tempt us to follow the social norms, right? to dress and act like our friends in order to feel like we belong, to sleep around rather than to remain celibate as singles or faithful in marriage, to backstab others and cheat in order to get ahead in school or at work. In summary, to conform to the world rather than to be transformed by the Lord. Now, the Lord has been gracious to us, friends, but this doesn't mean that we can now take His grace for granted, that we can live to please ourselves. For the Lord Jesus has purchased us for Himself, so that now we belong to him and we are to live for his pleasure. Like John, who received God's grace from birth to be his messenger 
who lived a life devoted to the Lord and to tell others about him, he, died, he even died as a witness for the Lord. We are unworthy recipients of God's grace, and we must live lives of gratitude, wholly devoted to God and telling others of His grace. We began our sermon with a story of God's unlikely grace, and unlikely grace in general, right? How two enemies from opposing sides in war can become unlikely friends and save each other. We shall now end with another story of unlikely grace. I'm not, not sure if you've read this. Local Christian uh, news site, Salt and Light, shared this heartwarming story last Friday about Nicholas Tay. So in this photo here, this is Nicholas in the centre, together with Elizabeth and Fernando Ginimes. They look so happy in this photo. And on the article, there were more photos taken uh, together with Nicholas and his wife and son and the Geminises. And I read from this article. They sit around the breakfast counter in his five-room HDB flat, talking and laughing like any family would. This, however, is no ordinary family. In fact, it is complicated. The Geminises are parents of Nicholas' former girlfriend, Maria. They're small. Five years ago, while studying in the United Kingdom, Nicholas took Maria for a spin in her car after they each had downed an equivalent of 10 shots of alcohol. Speeding at 160 kilometers per hour, he skidded while rounding a bend and crashed into a concrete road divider. He emerged largely unscathed. Maria died. Afterward, Nicholas would go personally to apologize to Maria's parents. And what did, what did Fernando and Elizabeth do? Did they deride him and punch him? No, they hugged him and they told him that they forgave him. And to make sure that he doesn't feel guilty about it, they kept in touch daily to assure him. And when he lost his lodging as a result of this, they invited him to live with them like their own son. And when the charges for drink driving came up, they wrote appeals for these charges to be dropped. However, eventually, Nicholas was sentenced to two years' imprisonment out of a maximum of 15. And throughout these two years, Fernando and Elizabeth would drive almost 100 km each way to visit him every week in prison. Each time, they would assure him of their love and forgiveness. This article came out after, uh, after Nicholas had gotten married, and so he invited the fa uh, Fernando and Elizabeth to stay with them and uh, to celebrate with his wife and his son. This is the kind of radical grace that God has shown to those us, those of us who killed his beloved son by our sins. God's unlikely grace has come to unlikely undeserving people like you and I. And Christmas reminds us how this grace has come to us in the incarnation of God's Son, His gift of grace to us. So friends, have you received God's grace by faith? And brothers and sisters, are you holding fast to God's grace against all personal doubts because of our trials and against all society pressures to succumb and to conform. Let's pray and ask God to help us to, to believe and to hold fast to His grace. Almighty God, we are so unworthy to receive Your grace to us, for we are wretched sinners who have despised Your loving rule. And yet by Your grace, Jesus, Your Son, died in our place, so that all who believe may come into your family to be called your children. Please help us to believe this and to hold fast to your grace that we might all come safely into the everlasting kingdom of our Saviour Jesus Christ. In his name we pray this. Amen.